Hello everyone. If I were to stand before you and take out a pack of smokes and light up a cigarette right now, you'd probably think I'm crazy. Well, for starters, you can't really smoke in here. And second, of course, we all know how uh, dangerous and harmful smoking is. But uh, these days it is common knowledge, but was it always like this? You see, people didn't start smoking on a massive scale uh, until after the First World War, and it was some years after the first automated cigarette-making machine was invented. And it took decades before scientists and researchers started linking increasing incidence of lung cancer with smoking. In, 1990, uh, in, 1996, in 1963, uh, the Surgeon General of the United States published a report uh, on health and smoking. And the report stated clearly that smoking is deadly. And yet it had to take um, many more decades before this knowledge and this awareness became mainstream. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, I think we have a great example of history repeating itself. This time is about sitting. Because you see, for some years now, there have been scientists which, uh, who are saying that uh, sitting can actually be just as harmful or even more than smoking. And so, hello again, my name is Marek Stuy, and I've been a programmer for more than 10 years now. But this fact is not really important at the moment. Because, as you might have probably guessed, this talk won't be uh, technical. Instead, I'm standing before you to tell you how dangerous sitting can really be. So, let's dive right into the first part of the talk. How sitting kills you. In 2014, a book was published titled Get Up. The author, Dr. James Levine, is a world-renowned expert on topics like obesity, sedentary behaviors, and negative effects of prolonged sitting. And this doctor is dead serious when he says that sitting is the new smoking. And going back to smoking uh, for a bit. So in the year 2000, researchers wanted to illustrate to the public how dangerous uh, smoking really is. And so they came up with these numbers that one cigarette smoke can cost a smoker 11 minutes of his or her life. And uh, taking, taking the whole lifespan, it might mean seven years lost. Now, Dr. Levine in his book states that one hour of sitting can actually cost us two hours of our lives. Well, when I read about this, uh, I was quite shocked. And so I did some simple math similar to the, um, to the calculations that the researchers did with smoking and making some assumptions as to at what age we usually start our careers, how much time we spend sitting, etc., etc., I've arrived at this rough estimate of 15 years lost due to sitting, given this assumption. It is quite shocking if it's true, of course, but let's keep that number in mind as we shall revisit it soon enough. Now, you might think that this whole concept, this idea that sitting can be actually dangerous and harmful to us, you know, might, might seem ridiculous to you, because after all, sitting is a very natural thing to us. But let me ask you this again, was it always like this? Well, no, if we just take a look at a wider horizon here, you'll see that our ancestors and our cousins evolved for millions of years as bipeds, as creatures moving on two legs. And what was natural to us then? Of course, um, upright position and movement. Our bodies actually evolved for movement. Of course, we did sit then, but it wasn't the norm. It was more to take a rest after hours of exploration, hunting, and a bit later, after hours of agricultural work. Now, what about our modern times? So we can say that around 60 or 70 years ago, the so-called digital revolution started. And with it came the era of computers and office work. Now, it's been estimated that uh, not as long as in 1960s and 70s, um, an average worker had at least uh, a moderate amount of movement in his or her job. So 
An example here uh, might be a person working on a printing press or at a factory uh, or at a, um, uh, or in a factory, right? Now, but currently it is uh, being estimated that more than 80% of workers actually s uh, sit on their buttocks all day long and it's getting worse and worse. But the thing is that it, uh, it's not the jobs that are the only problem here because let's take a look, an honest look, at how our average daily, uh, our, uh, daily life looks like. So we get up, we sit down to have our breakfast, we sit down in a car on a, on a bus or on a tram while we commute to work, then of course we sit in front of our computers. But when we get back, we sit in front of our TVs. When we go to a doctor, what do we usually do? We look for a place to sit down. And currently it's being estimated that on average, um, during the day, we spend eight hours sleeping, 13 hours sitting, and only three hours moving. It is that bad. So we can try to think where uh, this kind of a lifestyle can lead us. Well, in 2008, there was this awesome animated movie published, Wally. -E. If by any chance you haven't watched it yet, I highly recommend it. Now, in this movie, we're able to see a, a picture of society in which people are so obese and the muscles are so deteriorated that they can no longer move by themselves. Now, but by now you're probably wondering what it is exactly about sitting that is so dangerous and harmful to us. Well, it turns out that prolonged sitting negatively affects both our bodies as well as our minds. Let's start with the body. So, in 2000, um, and nine, I believe, there was an uh, article published titled Sitting Time and Mortality from All Causes, Cardiovascular Disease and Cancer. This article described a uh, prospective study which lasted for 12, year, uh, 12 years in which researchers uh, looked at the cohort of 17,000 Canadians ages 18 to 90. And uh, what they found is that there's a statistically significant correlation between how long people sit during their average day and their general mortality, as well as the mortality due to cardiovascular disease, which happens to be the number one cause of death, according to the list created by the World Health um, Organization. And the numbers that you see here, so it turned out that during this study, if a person spent the majority of the day sitting, and let's be honest, um, majority of most of us here are in this group, so these people had 50% higher risk of dying during this study. But that is just an example, because studies like these have been showing up for two or three decades, uh, linking sedentary behaviors to a lot of uh, different uh, diseases and health risks. So Dr. Levine in his book even has something that he calls an alphabet of sitting related illnesses. The list is quite long and we won't be going over all of them. I just wanted to point out a few. So naturally when we think about prolonged sitting we might think you know about back pain, spine conditions, but that's just a start because prolonged sitting has been linked to problems with the blood pressure, specifically hypertension, uh, colon cancer, mm, diabetes, type 2 diabetes and obesity. Uh, you can say a plague of our modern world has also been linked to it. Heart attack, various musculoskeletal disorders and the list goes on and on. But we are still not finished because let's now think about what sitting can do to our mental health and to our brains. So I believe it is also a common knowledge that physical activity and movement is actually good for our brains. Right? So it's been shown for example that just taking a walk can actually improve our cognitive functions and creativity. And they knew that even in ancient times. So Aristotle for example, he founded a school that was called 
a peripatetic school because there was this habit of walking back and forth during lectures or during some philosophical or scientific disputes. So, what happens when we sit down? Well, for starters, we become grumpy. You probably know this phrase, grumpy programmer or grumpy IT support guy. This might be one of the reasons that such a phrase exists. Because when we sit down, we become sad. We might even become angry or depressed even. And we definitely get stressed out. Because the mere fact that we are sitting causes our body to produce more cortisol, the stress hormone. And that's the reason that the majority of us these days live in a constant chronic stress. And again, Dr. Levine notices that one of the problems of our modern world is that when we get stressed out, instead of just getting up and going for a run, we sit down and we eat. So I hope that I was able to show you that many of these so-called civilization diseases can actually be traced back to sedentary behavior, sedentary lifestyle, and a prolonged sitting. Now, a natural question comes to mind, right? Is there anything that we can do about it? And the answer is yes. But before we get to that, I do have some bad news. Um, bad news to those of you who might think that these kind of problems don't concern you because, for example, you already lead this so-called active life. So in your leisure time, you, run, you do run, you go to a gym, you work out regularly, you play squash. Well, the problem is that it won't be enough. Even if you do that uh, for one hour every day, it just won't negate all those effects uh, that sitting causes. And in order to find out that it is actually the case, let us go back to this Canadian fitness study that I told you about already. So what you see here, these numbers are so-called hazard ratios. So hazard ratio is a term from epidemiology and statistics, which in this context we can interpret as a relative risk of dying, depending on how much time we spend sitting on average. And so, for example, the value of uh, 1.5 means that there's a 50% higher risk of dying. And the darker the bar, the more uh, time a person spent sitting. But what I wanted to point out in this particular slide is that uh, researchers, among other things, they split people into two groups, inactive and active. That is, those who declared that they're physically active in their leisure time, they regularly exercise uh, or play some sports. And if you take a closer look at the absolute values of hazard ratios, you will notice that the inactive group has larger values. But the problem is that even in the active group, the trend is still there. And so even if you do lead an active life, but you spend most of your day sitting, you still have 40% higher chance or higher risk of dying. All right, but there's a second myth uh, that I wanted to debunk now, uh, which is the so-called ergonomic chairs, because they're, not, they're also not uh, the solution to the problem. The chair that you see here, Aaron, has been designed and is being produced by the company uh, Herman Miller. Um, this chair is qu quite famous because a lot of people say that it's actually one of the most comfortable chairs in the world. And you might not even realize that you already seen this chair because Herman Miller uh, seems to like you know, product placement, placement just as much as Apple does with uh, its uh, MacBooks. Now, the, th the problem with ergonomic chairs is that they, they weren't really designed to be healthy. They were designed to be just comfortable. And they don't change the fact that we sit in them. And one of the major, major problems with sitting is that when we sit down and our back uh, our backs are supported, our core muscles, our postural muscles, they simply shut down because normally they have to stabilize our spine. But when we sit comfortably, they just turn off. And we all know 
that muscles that are not being used deteriorate with time. Now the funny thing is that even Herman Miller um, admits that. There's an article that they wrote and published in 2013. Uh, its title is Sit, Stand, Move and Repeat. And in this article they write, they wrote, I'll try to quote here, that the causal chain from prolonged sitting to potential health risk, risks exists even if a person sits in a highly adjustable ergonomic chair. So I think you can uh, you all agree that something's up, uh, you know, because even a chair manufacturer says things like these. Okay, but that actually brings us closer to the actual solution, which is we simply have to move more, but throughout the whole day. Doing that just in our leisure time is not enough. We have to do something about our workplaces. Now, you might think that our employers should provide you know, gyms uh, in our offices and we should work out while at work or something like that, which actually is not a bad idea in itself, but that is not something that I have in mind currently. So, in order to understand what I have in mind, we have to go back to our Dr. Levine and talk a little bit about this thing that he and other researchers have been studying for quite a while now. Uh, this thing is, is NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So what is this thermogenesis? Thermogenesis is a set of processes that produces heat within the body uh, in all warm-blooded animals and that of course includes human. And there are basically three types of thermogenesis. One is so-called diet-induced, which means that simply after we have a meal, our body starts using, generating and storing energy. The second type is exercise-related. Of course, when we exercise, we burn calories. Now, the third type is something that we're interested in now, is the energy expenditure due to any other activities non-exercise related. These are the things like simply walking with a dog, gardening, doing the dishes, even just standing. So it is like when we take a look at the chart of our metabolic rate, it is you know the long tail of it. And Dr. Levine and others have shown that the number of calories burned due to such trivial uh, activities can actually add up to a substantial amount. And so in order to further reinforce this idea of natural spontaneous movement, uh, I wanted to talk about this initiative called the Blue Zones Project. So a couple of years ago, this guy, Dan Bittner, together with National Geographic and uh, American National Institute on Aging, they set out to find places on Earth where people would live significantly longer than the general population and find out why that is. And, and a few years back, they managed to do just that. They found five such regions. Um, for example, Sardinia in Italy or Okinawa Islands in Japan. And so what they found out is that there are nine common traits to these regions. They called it power nine. And uh, I won't, again, I won't be going over all of them, although I do recommend to uh, seek more information about this project. It's pretty cool and uh, interesting. What I wanted to point out is what is at the very top of the pyramid, which is this natural spontaneous movement. Because you see, Dan said that he got to talk to a lot of these centenarians. That is, people who got to live to be 100 years old or even older and there were like more than 200 of them and he said that none of those people actually declared that they would do any sort of exercise at least not in our sense of the word instead physical activity and movement was naturally woven into their daily lives
So you see, even though they didn't exercise, they got to live 10 years longer than the rest of us, on average. And if you remember the number uh, at the beginning of the presentation, this rough estimate of 15 years lost due to sitting, it seems that Dr. Levine can actually be onto something here. And so I do hope that I was able to show uh, the importance of this spontaneous natural movement and that uh, just doing that in our leisure time just won't be enough. And so we have to do something about uh, our workplaces. And the simplest thing, the simplest step that we can take in the right direction is to simply stand up. Because the mere act of standing actually increases our metabolic rate by about 30%. Our blood flow, blood circulation improves. When we stand, we actually tend to, you know, fidget more. And all that actually increases our need throughout the day. Standing, uh, in a sense, is also like a gateway to other forms of movement. And one, what I wanted to stress here is that this is our end goal, actually, movement, more movement throughout the day. But from this point forward, we'll be focusing on standing because this is the very first step that we can take in this direction and this right direction. And as you can see here, and as you might have probably guessed, I am talking about uh, working in a standing position, you know, height adjustable desks. You might have seen them, you might have even tried them, but I would, uh, I would guess not a lot of you uh, work in a standing position on a regular basis, which I highly, highly recommend you to do so. Now, but the problem is that even if you wanted to try this, you might uh, say that, okay, but my employer doesn't provide such equipment in our office, for example. So let me tell you a story then. So a while back, I was working uh, for a company almost 100% of time remotely. And so I wanted to create a nice uh, workplace, my home. And because I already uh, knew about you know, working in a standing position, so I set out to find a desk for myself, but was uh, quite disappointed to find out that you know these electrically adjustable desks, they cost a lot. So, um, so I kept searching and what I eventually ended up doing, I bought the parts separately, so I was able to bring down the cost, but it was still quite expensive. But after some time, I decided to change jobs. And imagine my disappointment when I had to go back to the office because remote work was not, uh, no longer an option for me, and they didn't have any uh, such desks. Fortunately, I noticed that a couple of colleagues uh, in an adjacent room they somehow managed to work in a standing position. And their solution uh, is, was so simple yet so brilliant, they had to copy it. And currently my workplace looks like these. So it is just an I IKEA table uh, with a shelf attached for the keyboard, right? The cost of it is incomparable to this electrically adjustable desk. But the funny thing is that I like this solution even better than my desk uh, at home. And I'll tell you why that is the case. So the problem with working in a standing position is that you just won't be able to do that all day long while being productive and while maintaining proper posture. And that's actually not something that researchers recommend. You don't have to stand all the time. You should be alternating positions between sitting and standing. And when you uh, start out with this, you won't be able to stand like for more than 10 or 15 minutes uh, until your legs start to hurt. So you just have to sit down. But this, um, but if you want, you know, if you need to change the position of the desk, adjust its height every 20, 30 minutes or so, it can be quite distracting. You're probably familiar with this uh, uh, state of mind called flow or being in a zone, right? It is this state that you are so productive and usually you have to work on a somewhat challenging problem, you know, but this state is great because, you know, you don't notice anything that's happening uh, in the outside world. You don't notice the pass of time, but you are very, very productive. But the problem with this state is that it's very volatile. 
you know, an innocent question from a colleague might get you out of it and it will take some time for you to get back to it. And that is the problem with height adjustable desks. But with the IKEA do-it-yourself solution, I actually have you know, two monitors, one at the top, one at the bottom, two keyboards and one and wireless mouse. So And so alternating positions didn't take uh, that much time whatsoever. And that allowed me you know, to stay in this flow state. So I really do love this uh, solution. Now, if you'd like to try building something like that yourself, let me just remind you uh, the, the parts. So the IKEA table, uh, this one's called LAC. It's quite popular, I guess. You know, the shelf board I bought in a, like home, any home improvement store. Uh, shelf brackets, a couple of screws, and you should be good to go. But what is important in all of this, regardless of the solution that you choose for working in a standing position, you have to remember about a, a couple of things. One of them being that you have to set the, the monitor at a uh, proper height so that the, its top edge is aligned with your sight. And the keyboard should be placed so that when you uh, bend your arms, they should be bent at around 90 to 100 degrees. And the last but not least is uh, that when you are doing this kind of try-ons for this IKEA do-it-yourself, or when you then later work in a standing position, you have to maintain proper posture. It's very important. But what does it mean actually uh, to stand properly? What is the correct posture? In order to answer that, let me turn to another book, which was re uh, published in 2016 not so long ago. The title is Desk Bound and it's been written by Dr. Kelly Starrett, which is a CrossFit trainer, a physical therapist who works with, uh, you know, world-class athletes, weightlifters, etc. And this is actually the book, the book that inspired me to actually dig deeper into these topics. And I, uh, I can't recommend this book highly enough. It was a real eye-opener uh, to me. And there's a lot of interesting things that Dr. Starrett writes about in this book. And unfortunately, won't be able to go into more detail. What I wanted to focus is on is that Dr. Starrett uh, identified three major problems with our modern world. Is So the first one being that we simply have to move more. We have to move properly and we have to regularly maintain our bodies. And the second point actually is related to standing and proper posture because a proper starting position is very important um, you know before you start actually moving and so there's uh, Dr. Starrett spends a lot of time actually describing what is what it means to stand properly and instead of me telling you about this I would like to ask you to just stand for like two minutes and we'll go over this bracing sequence which is just a series of simple steps that uh, you know, we'll position our body in a healthy, natural position. So if you could just please stand up for two minutes, let's do this together. <coughs> All right. So the first step is that we place our feet um, parallel to each other, pointing forward, and we squeeze our gluteal muscles, that is our buttocks, right? This causes our pelvis to actually reset to its uh, natural, neutral position. And the other thing that we're trying to do here is like screw our feet into the ground uh, outwards. That causes uh, an external rotational force coming out of our hips that uh, stabilizes and positions our pelvis even further. In the second step, in a second, we will take a deep breath and ideally this should be a you know, through our diaphragms. And while we exhale, we'll try to keep two things in mind. So one is to tighten our abdominal muscles, and the other is to making sure that our rib cage is pos positioned directly above our hips. Okay, so let's take a deep breath now. And while exhaling, just keep your abdominal muscles tightened. It doesn't have to be a maximum force, like 20% is just enough. In the next step, uh, we look at our shoulders and anatomically speaking, we're doing a very similar thing as we did with our legs. 
we just want to exert a ex rotational force in our shoulders so let's um, rotate them so that our palms point forward okay and in the next step we pull our head back a little so actually the end goal here is to uh, position in a straight vertical line our ears our shoulders our hips knees and ankles okay and now relax our formals while maintaining this tightness in buttocks and abdominal muscles and that's it that is the natural healthy position for a human body to you know to to be standing in and so thank you 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 can sit down now if you want of course after hearing so much about the dangers of sitting like if uh, any of you like practice yoga it's very similar to a sequence look to a tadasana position it's very similar all right so that concludes the second part of the talk in the third part I would like to talk about the um, topics these topics from a different angle maybe from a wider uh, perspective because if you think about it <coughs> we uh, we could have heard voices that lack of movement lack of physical activity is bad for us for a, for a long time now like uh, for example in 1996 there was another report published by the Surgeon General of the United States and it was more than 30 years after the one about smoking this one was about physical activity and health and even then we could read statements like these in this report that families need to weave physical activity into their daily lives or that health professionals should encourage their patients to get out of their chairs and this was more than 20 years from now so tell me why does it seem that we haven't yet done anything about our workplaces why the hell do we keep sitting ourselves to death I can think of a couple of reasons or excuses if you will the first one being this just a lack of awareness the very same problem as it was with smoking people are just not well informed enough um, the second reason even if you are aware and would like to try for example this uh, working in a standing position you could say that okay but my employer doesn't provide such equipment but to that I will say you can actually uh, very cheaply do a you know like a do-it-yourself solution you can figure it out and also I worked for a company uh, who had a bunch of offices in one city and all of those office offices have been equipped were equipped with uh, height adjustable desks but guess how many people worked in a standing position on a regular basis almost nobody so that's not also uh, that also not the problem not the main problem at least and so I have this hypothesis that there's a third issue at play here which is simply the fear the fear of being the weirdo an outsider you know the fear of what others might think of you you know someone looking at you funny or smiling well actually laughing at you so this is of course just a hypothesis based on my experience and you know talking to some friends but I personally believe that this is one of the major reasons that we haven't done anything about our workplaces yet and this is not a sim simple problem to solve it would require some kind of a, a cultural shift but interestingly enough we could see uh, how such a shift could look like as far back as 2007 because then the owner of the company called Salo actually approached Dr. Levine um, he was a you could say he was a fan of Dr. Levine's work and so he asked him if he could design an office for his employees where where they could test you know this whole neat thing to provide you know to make it so that the employees have more physical activity at their workplaces and Dr. Levine agreed to do that and what followed was a two years long experiment uh, in which people got to, uh, to work in an environment like these like this so not only everyone had a high adjustable desks at their disposal they even had treadmills uh, under their desks so you know they could walk at a very slow pace throughout the day 
they also had other ideas like for example they put some tape on the floor so they could have uh, walking meetings or you know if you wanted to um, call someone you would just walk around the office and the simple ideas uh, made it so that you know these employees had a much more physical activity during the day than an average office worker. Uh, another thing that Dr. Levin did is he set up a you know whole laboratory there in this office so he could you know examine the employees and measure these health indicators like cholesterol levels, glucose levels, etc etc. And after two years the results of this experiment you know you can say were phenomenal. Let's take a look at some of the benefits that were observed. So people lost some weight and they even gained some muscle. All of those health indicators actually uh, improved. Uh, and what was also important from the perspective of the company, employees in improved their productivity, they, they had increased creativity, uh, even financial profits uh, were improved. But this is not what, me, uh, what struck me the most when I read, ab read about this experiment. What struck me the most was this. Increased happiness. Because interesting thing happened. Not so long after the experiment started, people started to have, uh, well, people started to become more active not only uh, at work but also at their homes. So suddenly had this, they had this energy to spend more time with their families, to play with their kids, and to pursue their goals and dreams for which they didn't have energy before. They were simply happier. And don't you think this is something worth fighting for? I deeply believe so. And so did Dr. James Levine. Just take a look at this quote from his book. At a personal workplace and national level, a cheerless revolution, a national uprising of human movement, will improve productivity and generate revenue, better health, clean air, and enhance happiness. However, the sad thing about this is that this experiment took place more than 10 years ago. And apparently, this kind of ideas, you know, for modern workplaces, um, are being implemented in more and more companies, at least in the US, but by no means uh, it is mainstream. And so I think that this revolution is just not happening fast enough. For my sake, your sake, as well as the sake of our children. And when I was thinking about this, an idea for a project popped into my head. This project has a, has a name now, and I wanted to tell you about it. It's called Stand It Up. You see, I think, no, I actually, I believe that Dr. Levine is right that we are at the verge of a revolution that will change our workplaces, how we work. And I also believe that in order to speed up this revolution, to kickstart it, is to start with our industry, IT. Why do I think so? Well, I think all of you are aware of how you know job market looks like currently for in the IT industry, especially for programmers, but not only for them. You know, employers have a really hard time finding experienced specialists, and so they are actually willing to do quite a lot in order to attract talent and retain it. Hence, these you know so-called benefits. But I do have an appeal to the employers. Instead of providing us chill-out rooms with latest video game consoles, why don't you organize mini gyms? Instead of providing us free soda and sweets, why don't you, you know, finance height adjustable desks or at least reimburse us for our do-it-yourself solution? I would even go so far as to say that we should work less, of course earning the same amount of money, let's say seven hours instead of eight, what about this uh, one hour? Well, we could use this hour for things like simple gymnastics, stretching, practicing yoga. Ideally, these activities would be spread out throughout the day in order to you know, keep the neat levels high. And yes, you heard me right. 
I argue that we should work less, sit less, move more, and earn the same amount of money, or even more. In other words, I say we should stand up for ourselves. Because in the end, this is our health on the line here. And let's be honest here. Your employer doesn't care about your health, at least not in the long term. Because the brutal truth is that we are all expandable. But there's a bit of irony here, because these companies might not realize that they might be losing out by not providing us you know, these, let's call them benefits, which I think we should be you know, asking for or demanding even. Because there's this opportunity cost that they pay, which is about not realizing the full potential of their workforce, as the Salo experiment demonstrated. <coughs> All right, so uh, a few a few more words about the project itself. So there are three main goals for it. So one is to simply raise the awareness um, by doing simple things like you know uh, posting links to interesting articles about this and, and such. But I think also, and what is even more important, by talking about this and sharing this idea directly by going to meetups and conferences. The very thing that I'm doing right now. The second goal is um, to facilitate this cultural shift. And I believe in order to do that, we have to also reach out to the employers and educate also them. And, you know, so that they can see that it's actually a win-win situation here and it doesn't have to be expensive. And the third thing, you know, is about uniting us by providing a platform, whether online or in real life, where we can meet, discuss, share our experiences and share our ideas, you know, for bringing more activity into our sedentary workplaces. As we are nearing the end of the presentation, um, I wanted to tell you why am I even doing all this? What is my motivation here? So I've been passionate about computers since I can remember. I think I've been, I was seven or eight when I wrote my first program in BASIC on a Commodore 64. And I think that even then I knew what I wanted to become in the future. I wanted to become a programmer. And so I did become one. And with that came countless hours of coding, not only at my job, but also after it. Because for a geek like me, there was always, you know, a new shiny technology or framework or an interesting side project to develop. And all of those hours coding spent sitting, of course. Add to that the fact that I was also a smoker for many, many years. And if you remember the estimates from the beginning about years of life lost due to smoking and sitting, uh, I wonder how is it that I'm still standing here before you. But anyway, over the 10 years or so of my career, I experienced these three times. I experienced, let's call them breakdowns, nervous breakdowns. So episodes where I was totally demotivated, depressed even, and hopefully I was able to dig out myself out of this, uh, mostly due to the help of my close ones, for which I'm very grateful. But the problem was that shortly after I always reverted back to the old behaviors. You might have heard that uh, apparently it was Einstein who said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So according to this definition, I was insane. Now, you see, the human body is a marvelous machine. Marvelous because it can endure and sustain years and years of abuse, but it will break eventually. And my body was giving me signals and was telling me that I was doing something wrong, but I just didn't listen. Well, at least not until this last breakdown, which was really not so long ago, because I think that I finally realized something, you know, a uh, switch flipped into my, uh, in, my, in my head, and I finally realized that if I want to, you know, keep doing what I love, which is coding, and I want to keep my career path, then I have to take care of my body. I have to quit smoking, I have to start moving more, and now I also believe that it is equally important for me to quit sitting 
to stand up. All right. So I told you a story about myself, but was it uh, only my story? Because when I think about it, a parable uh, comes to mind, you know, about this boiling frog. So apparently when you take a living frog and throw it into boiling water, uh, the frog will just jump out of it. But if you put it into cold, in a cold water and start to slowly heat it up, the frog won't notice the steadily increasing temperature and it will just get cooked to death. So let me leave you with a question that I think we should be asking ourselves. Could it be that we are all such frogs too? Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yes. Two years ago I was attending a meditation class in All right, so the question is, uh, you know, about the situation where you actually tr uh, try to stand and you feel exhausted uh, or tired from, from standing. So uh, I believe that you have to start slowly and build up uh, from there and, you know, wait a bit until your body adapts. Because as I mentioned before, like when you start, start out, you won't be able to stand for an hour or two right let alone two hours so uh, I think that's uh, that's why it's important to be able to alternate between positions as soon as you feel that your legs uh, hurt for example you just switch to to sitting and all the time this proportion will shift for me it took like uh, a month for example of doing that and currently I work like 50 50 or 60 percent for standing 40 percent for for sitting so uh, I don't know about your particular case, whether you tried to uh, stand from the get-go for an ex for extended periods of time. I would I would suggest to start slowly and build it up. And I, for me, at least, I can uh, in, from my experience, I felt more energized uh, after some time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, so the question is, can you actually be keep being productive and be like being focused uh, yeah, while standing, just as you are when sitting? So, not at first, but I was, you know, after reading these books and research papers, I was highly motivated to try it. And at first, it was actually a problem, especially when it comes to programming tasks, like answering emails or writing some documentation, that's, that's fine. But programming actually was a problem at first. But I'd say after three weeks or, or a month, I can be um, as productive as when I'm sitting. And also you mentioned uh, meditation. But uh, keep in mind that when you meditate, you actually sit differently. Yeah, And actually, you can sit in a better way, uh, which is like on a chair without the support. Like if you sit with your back uh, straight or on a ball, a gym, gymnastics ball. It is all about activating your postural muscles. It's not that sitting uh, comes with a different problems, like for example, shortening some uh, some muscles, like if you keep constantly sitting in this position, but at least your postural muscles uh, do work. Mm -hmm. Mm 
You mean, yeah, like a Japan seat, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like a lotus position or the crossed legs position. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Thanks for pointing it out. Mm -hmm. There was a question back then. Uh, mm -hmm. Really? Yes. That's actually yeah, very very uh, good catch. So uh, what he's saying is about this diagram. Um, here, yeah. So we have a zero point nine two. So yeah, actually, s standing is not a silver bullet. You have to alternate. It's not like you have to switch to standing all the time. The, you know, but uh, people who work while standing all the time also have their their problems, right? So you have to strike a balance here. This is a very good observation and an interesting fact about Gethe. Yeah, thank you. Yes, please. Um, so Dr. Dr. Starrett actually in his book uh, mentions a like half sitting, half lying position, like you know when you lean back. But he argues that it is uh, it is um, not so bad position for the spine and for your body when it comes to to tension, for example. But he wouldn't recommend that for for work, rather for rest, because you still uh, your muscles are not activated here. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine that this argument would stand that you're still, uh, s well, you keep still, you're not moving, that's one of the problems, because remember the end goal was to have more movement and also you don't have to activate your postural muscles. But this position puts less stress on your spine than sitting upright. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess that's it. Thank you very much.